This is the voice of Zimbabwe. This is the voice of Zimbabwe broadcasting on Radio Mozambique in Maputo. Pamberi ne Chimurenga. Pamberi ne Hondo. Pamberi ne Rujinjiru Zimbabwe. Pasi ne imperialism. Pasi ne neo-colonialism. Pasi na Ian Smith. Pasi na Dabaningi Sitole. Pasi na Abel Muzorewa. Aluta continua. The Patriotic Front is now broadcasting your program through Radio Mozambique, people of Zimbabwe. Victory is certain. Maputo, once called Lorenzo Marx, the capital of Mozambique, which now plays host to the largest, most secretive guerrilla army operating against Zimbabwe Rhodesia. Its leader is said to be a terrorist. He's so hated and feared that his fellow countrymen are forbidden to publish his name, Robert Mugabe. How, how are you this? For so long, spurned by the West and branded as the man who massacres the innocent, Mugabe is now a key figure in the London talks. In Maputo, this is his central committee, his inner cabinet, and these are probably the most educated of the Salisbury regime's opponents. Almost every man here has spent a decade shut away without trial in Rhodesian jails. Simon Mozenda, the party's vice president. Edgar Takiri, secretary general. All of them were educated by Christian missionaries. Some once tried to forge a peaceful, multiracial community within Rhodesia. But even those like Dinimus Mutasa are now all revolutionaries. Under the instant, under the instant rule committee, under the high command, under the general staff, under the Mumbai Zimbabwe, under the Hondo, under the Chimre. It's these people who've set the pace in Rhodesia's 14-year war. There are two main guerrilla armies formed into a hitherto tenuous alliance called the Patriotic Front. Based in Zambia, Joshua Nkomo and his party Zapu. About 2,000 of his troops are now thought to be operating inside Rhodesia. To the east, with its headquarters in Maputo, is Robert Mugabe's ZANU, the Zimbabwean African National Union. Its army, ZANLA, is widely conceded to have over 8,000 troops in Rhodesia at any one time. Of the two leaders, Mugabe is the least known, but he's grown to become a powerful contender for total control of a new independent Zimbabwe. And Mugabe holds a trump card in the London talks. Since ZANU, even more than ZAPU, is still committed in the field to extending the war, ZANU's agreement is essential if the war is to be ended. But despite appeals for a ceasefire, the latest of them yesterday, Mugabe is sticking to his guns. There's no doubt that our people want peace. But uh, the uh, great bulk of the people, the majority of the people who have suffered under the regime, for um, over 90 years do not want peace at all cost. They would like an honorable peace, a peace which will enable them to uh, assume the sovereignty of the country. And if this is not forthcoming, I'm sure they will be prepared that we continue the war. Could there be a settlement which didn't put the patriotic front in power in Salisbury. No, what, what we are really negotiating is not a settlement that is just favorable to the patriotic front. It's a settlement favorable to anybody, any group whatsoever, which would like to participate in elections. The image of Mugabe presented by the British press has been consistently hostile. A survey conducted for this program found that during 1978, the 16 major Fleet Street papers published 20,903 column inches on Rhodesia. But of all that they said, only 30% was found in the survey to be neutral or unbiased, despite a cautious system of classification which was designed to favour the newspapers. In fact, 50% of all column inches broadly reflected the views of white Rhodesians and almost all the news came from Salisbury. Only 20% reported the views of the Patriotic Front. It's an imbalance that a former Rhodesian Prime Minister acknowledges, 
Garfield Todd. If there is an atrocity which is blamed on the guerrillas, the government will fly in people and let them see it. If the government shoots 60 innocent villag villagers or, or Napalm, a, a village, they don't fly in the journalists to let them see that. Really? Place the sights on the battle. Television and radio have the same problems. Vastly outnumbered by black Africans in their own country and jostled by hostile black African nations along most of her borders. The Salisbury regime has worked hard at gaining a favourable image. It claims a free press, but often stage manages where journalists can go and what they can see. Even then, news reports are sometimes censored. Journalists are normally forbidden to enter tribal trust lands where 80% of blacks live, so they may have to rely on government handouts. Those who displease the regime are sometimes given private warnings, refused work permits, or even expelled. Inside Zimbabwe, Rhodesia, it's forbidden to use the words freedom fighter or guerrilla. But the guerrillas themselves have repeatedly denied reporters access to their armies, even to their leaders, and so the stereotypes are easily reinforced. ...armed and indisciplined terrorists close to equal terms with trained soldiers. Mugabe's notorious murder list, an intemperate threat to collaborators, was widely condemned, but no mention was made of Smith's death list. The Salisbury regime actually puts a price on guerrilla leaders' heads, dead or alive. You know, Mr. Mugabe, there are many white Rhodesians, and there are many in Britain and the rest of the Western world too, who regard you as a thoroughly evil man. Mrs. Mugabe, how, how do you feel about that? I think it hurts to some extent. Uh, it hurts because these people who talk like that have not taken the trouble to get to know the man. And uh, they just speak from what they hear from others. They read from other newspapers what is uh, propaganda against him, and they take it in like that. This is what hurts. But well, uh, otherwise, I think it's politics. It's part of the game. My wife gets hurt by these things. Naturally, she uh, feels for her husband. But uh, to tell you the truth, in politics, you have to have an inbuilt system of shock absorbers. And uh, I just don't care what they say, as long as I know I'm right. So they can say anything in their papers, uh, damage me in every way possible, as long as the people I lead are behind me and approve of what we are doing. That's what matters. The rest of the world will one day, you see, be uh, uh, persuaded to believe we were right when we uh, resorted to armed struggle. Since they first chased the blacks from their land in 1890, power has been almost exclusively wielded by the whites. The first rebellions were in 1893 and 1896, but they were crushed with help from Britain and the leaders were executed. For Mugabe, these were the first martyrs of the revolution. Zimbabweans resigned themselves to serfdom, but bitter memories passed into African folklore. The revulsion, I think, started uh, through the stories that our parents used to narrate to us, how the white man came to the country, how he grabbed the land, and in a society where you have a class whose main purpose and accepted privilege is to exploit others, you naturally get reversed if the majority of people are being oppressed, being exploited. You can't avoid, if you have any moral principles at all, um, the call to do something about it. To this day, while all white children complete secondary education, only 3% of blacks do. Robert Mugabe was lucky. There was a Catholic mission right beside his village. But even missionaries weren't exempt from prejudice. Edison Schwabgo. We were in Form 4, and were invited by the um, uh, superintendent, who is a minister, Wesleyan Methodist, to come to his house as a class for, um, for tea. Um, we had the tea, uh, we sat in the sofas, uh, and just as we were walking out, we actually saw his wife come down uh, with a fumigator and fumigating the seats 
where we were, where, in which we had um, been sitting just a few moments ago. I went out and cried and I vowed I'd never again go to church. Back in the 50s and 60s, black political aspirations were modest. They wanted simple political rights, but even their demonstrations were banned. As frustration mounted, moderation turned to militancy, passive resistance turned to civil disobedience, and the seeds were sown for a full-scale civil war. You cannot fight these grievances by pleading for their rectification. You can only do so by getting to the root cause of the problem. And that's the, the, uh, the problem of power. But at that point, you were firmly committed to achieving power through the ballot box. Yes, through the ballot box, that's at right. At what stage did you very first consider that it might be necessary, in your view, to use a gun? To use petrol bombs as far back as 1960, and we were the first to use them, but purely as a means of pressure not really to try and destroy life, but to intimidate um, the authorities into conceding, as it were, to our wishes. Did it, it didn't work. Then we had um, demonstrations and uh, strikes. She participated in one of the most, uh, best organized demonstrations in the country, the women's demonstration. Thousands of them were sent to prison in Salisbury and thousands sent to prison in, in Bulawayo and Guelo and Umtali in 1961. Then, in 1962, black opposition was banned. Overnight, the authorities turned ZAPU from a legitimate political party into an underground resistance. Hundreds were arrested and imprisoned without trial. Resentment began to burn more fiercely. In 1963, the more radical elements, most of them in prison, broke away from ZAPU to form ZANU, prison became their campaign headquarters. The young Mugabe was to spend 11 years in detention, away from his wife and his only child. Then I had the little boy, and then uh, he died. And How did he die? He had uh, malaria with convulsions, and uh, we couldn't you know, save him. She sent um, a telegram to that effect through my sister, and we got the news. That was it. There was nothing you could do. It was a terrible event. But uh, there was nothing you could do. I tried to get permission to go and bury my child, but it wasn't uh, possible to get that permission. The authorities wouldn't allow. This is the Rhodesia Broadcasting Corporation. Then, in 1965, came UDI. Any chance of a peaceful transition to black government was destroyed, in the words of Ian Smith, for a thousand years at least. I believe that we are a courageous people, and history has cast us in a heroic road. Britain lacked the will to put down this constitutional treason. The UN could only offer sympathy and sanctions, and the scene was set for guerrilla warfare. It must be a terrible responsibility to have to bear to know that you were instrumental in starting a war. I mean, however just you feel a conflict to be. No, 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 no. He said that I, I didn't feel any conflict at all. I felt justified. There was the whole history of our having tried non-violent methods. They had failed completely. And um, neither the uh, settler regime nor Britain heeded our cries. They just... Uh, uh, wouldn't move, they wouldn't yield an inch. And so we decided, uh, without any uh, qualms about it, that armed struggle would uh, be the right thing. Have either of you personally ever carried a gun or, or fired a shot in anger? <laughs> That's what Smith says about me, that I haven't fired a shot in anger. But uh, I'm not a trained soldier such. I'm a revolutionary nevertheless. It's a revolution that's brought out that most conservative of emotions, plain, old-fashioned patriotism. Zimbabweans are always said to be a gentle people, but ZANU now claims to have 40 or 50,000 able-bodied personnel, and it's broadly accepted that they've up to 15,000 men and women at arms. 
ZANU's military commander, Josiah Tongagara, was the most feared and wanted man in Ian Smith's Rhodesia. He trained for a time in China, but had to learn the hard way how to fight a guerrilla war. We have learned a lot. In fact, I would rather say Smith is a great teacher. Smith is a great teacher? Yes, because all the attacks he has made on us has improved our tactics. So each attack he makes, we sit down, analyze it, make scientific analysis, and then we come out with some solution to it, and that is part of increasing our knowledge. But Tongagara's army has been accused of grotesque atrocities, massacring missionaries, butchering and intimidating blacks. ZANU blames Rhodesia's undercover troops, but neither side will admit to anything more serious than an occasional misdemeanor. These pictures are published by Zimbabwe Rhodesia's Information Ministry. If you have got an army of, say, about 40,000, 50,000, you, know, you, you are likely to find some people who made people who may even commit some atrocities. But definitely, this we are trying to stamp it out. And we have been trying that, and, uh, and we have never had any official report of a group of Zanla forces going to, 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 to massacre the people. We are fighting a war which is a very difficult one. But in spite of the difficulties posed by the enemy, we take care not to make people unnecessarily suffer. But I quote from your own publication, Zimbabwe News, all land to the tillers, socialism now, you have to hit a racist settler in the groin and skull hard, very hard, very, very hard, before you can get him to scream those words. That's what we proposed, that's what we will continue to do till final victory. Let us never forget that only a dead imperialist is a good one. Now, is that the kind of language that's likely to make soldiers behave responsibly? This is only a dramatic way of saying we are waging a struggle to overthrow the settler system. It does not literally mean that uh, we go all out to destroy the whites. No, we are fighting a just war aimed at the overthrow of the settler government, which is presently oppressing our people. As you see, I wonder whether language like that might not incite young men to commit the most appalling acts within the conflict. No one is fighting an individual war. All our fighters are fighting collectively under a command that, that derives its authority from the Central Committee of the Party. Inside Zimbabwe, the guerrillas say they've widespread support. This ZANU film was taken in what they call a liberated area, where they claim to have effectively set up their own administration, even to the extent of giving white farmers ZANU passes for safe conduct. They're farming themselves, sometimes on a huge scale, and they're teaching the villagers how to put their theories of socialist cooperation into practice. Do you find a lot of supporters among the villagers? Oh, yes, oh, yes. We, 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 when we open a new area, we don't just go and fight. First of all, we make a, a study, investigation among the masses. They tell us their, their national grievances, and those we exploit and use them. We tell, you explain to them why you, you have come to, to them, why you are fighting this war. They have to understand it, and they have to. Or you have also got to explain the difficulties uh, 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 which come, which will come thereafter from the enemy, because the enemy is going to, 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 to conduct some atrocities. So you have got to explain this to them, and you let them volunteer themselves and say, yeah, yeah, we are, we are ready for that. We are prepared to, 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 to face any difficulties in order to liberate our own country. This man knows from personal experience whether Tongagara and Mugabe are broadly telling the truth or not. Johannes Martens was kidnapped from his farm last year and spent six months in ZANU captivity. When he and another white were released, both praised the guerrillas, though in Britain only two national newspapers reported what they said. Now out of danger, and presumably to the bewilderment of most of his white compatriots, Mr. Martins still insists that the guerrillas did not live up to their terrorist image. First of all, I thought, well, uh, this is it now, you know. Uh, this is where uh, the end of my road will be, you know. This is where they're going to burn me alive. This is where they're going to really have the joy of, uh, you know, cutting me up or doing, you know, I've read it, I've seen it, I heard it, uh, read in the papers how these people will be tortured. I mean, it's, 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 it's not a secret. But in fact, you were treated well. If I must be honest, 
then I cannot say otherwise. Never have they ever laid a hand on me. Were the villagers, did they appear to be sympathetic towards... My goodness me, what do you mean? I mean, how would you put it? I mean, here yeah, they are the terrorists. Here yeah, they go and get these people together. They are rejoicing, uh, to, to put it, uh, you know, at least. I mean, these people were shouting and laughing and happy, and uh, they were actually rejoicing. Well, I can tell you one story that happened not too far away from me, where some guerrillas came into a small group of, of houses, and the people welcomed them, and the women went and cooked for them. Uh, there was a poor old sub-chief there whose job it is to report anything that's wrong. And if he didn't report this, he knew that he could be put into jail for 20 years. And now that we've got martial law in some areas, if he'd lived in one of those areas, he could be hanged. So he quietly took his bicycle and went off and reported it to the authorities, thinking that they would let him go back and perhaps send some soldiers back with him. But by that time, the guerrillas would be away. However, they kept him at the centre and they sent out some soldiers dressed as guerrillas who, when they entered the village, of course were received as true guerrillas would be received. But they opened up with their automatic weapons and killed five people, including two teenage girls, and went on their way. Well, the old sub-chief hadn't come back, but he came back the next day and the people by this time quite knew what had happened. So they just took him and killed him. And this is one of the terrible things, the division of families, the enmities that are made, the whole tragic story where there should have been an evolution. Now we're in a revolution. Revolution is an intoxicating theory. Its reality is tragic. Zimbabwe Rhodesia is now a land of refugees. Not just a few thousand well-publicized whites, but well over a quarter of a million blacks have fled the country, and most of them have gone to Mozambique. Neither ZANU nor the impoverished Mozambicans can cope. Despite growing aid from the United Nations and the World Council of Churches, there's precious little medicine and hardly any food. The result is pitiful. Many of these families have fled here simply to escape the fighting. Many more have made the dangerous journey to escape from the guarded corrals, which the Salisbury regime calls protected villages, but which some of the refugees describe as open prisons. But they're not always safe, even here. Just after dawn on the 23rd of November, 1977, Rhodesian paratroops began an attack on two camps near Chimoyo and Nyadzonia in Mozambique described as terrorist bases. According to the UN at one camp, there were no combatants, only refugees. Planes came in the morning and uh, carried out such massacres, dropped paratroopers, who then as ground force ringed this camp, uh, these two camps. And as these youngsters started running in all directions, they were bayoneted. Uh, I'll never forget the sight of um, the little kids at the school uh, where the bombs were dropped with their pencils and paper outside and the little bodies scattered everywhere. It, it was so brutish, it was incredible. They killed the sick, dragging them from, from ambulances and beheading them. You see, to this day, we have not attacked one white school in the country. Not because those kids are defended. We have not attacked one white hospital in the country. When we are absolutely certain everyone seeking there is white. Princess Margaret Hospital. We could hit it tomorrow. We said no. It's barbaric. It doesn't belong to the 20th century. That's not the way you fight a war. If 400 children were killed in London or in New York, it would be a story never to forget. It would be everywhere. But no, it wasn't 
given any publicity at all abroad. It was just, um, you know, be maybe because it's black kids. Uh, it may be it's black women. Can your enemies today become your friends, your allies, your fellow countrymen tomorrow, or will there be a period of revenge and recrimination? This question has been asked before, and I think what people would want to know is whether those who have committed genocide and massacres uh, will become our friends tomorrow. I don't know what uh, the Allies would have answered if, the, if a qu similar question had been asked in 1945, 1946, whether Hitler and Mussolini would become the allies of Churchill and uh, Roosevelt. Um, our answer is that those who are architects of this genocide and massacres surely must, on uh, the basis of moral and uh, legal principles, be brought to trial. But this does not mean that the followers, the ordinary person, must be tried. Those who have hatched the uh, plan the treason, as a result of which uh, massacres of all kinds have been perpetrated against our people and against the people of Mozambique, people of Zambia, Angola and Botswana, surely must be brought to book for their crimes. Would that include Bishop Muzarewa? Bishop Muzarewa is a mere puppet, an unwitting puppet for that matter. And um, just now he claims he has power, but we know he hasn't got that power. We have appealed to him to reverse uh, his stand and um, uh, uh, correct the stance he has uh, adopted so far. So he and, could and remain free as a Democrat sure, in opposition sure, to you? Sure, he could, as long as he's prepared not to continue, you see, upholding the evil system there is. I suppose this conference gives him a chance to say his repentance and uh, ask for forgiveness of his sins. The Rhodesians claim to have killed well over 10,000 terrorists in this war. It's hard to tell how many were innocent civilians, but there's no doubt ZANU combatants have suffered badly too. You stepped on a mine? Yes. And what happened to you? You know, because the mine, I lost my leg. Ah. I just felt disappointed, but then after that, I knew the war was going to continue and I, I knew that was going to make his mother free. Because in a fight you've got to die and you've got to be injured. Are you still pleased that you joined ZANU? Oh. ZANU <laughs> is the only party you see which I found to be the, the only party that can fight imperialism until to the end. ZANU's headquarters in Maputo. A parcel bomb sent here through the post. The bomb uh, blew up uh, the door that side and cracked the wall right out to the other end. What happened to them? He was, um, he died within um, a few moments of reaching hospital. His entire leg, the, the intestines and the chest all cracked up. And four other young um, uh, comrades were injured. Hello, yes, this is our headquarters. ZANU is run rather inefficiently by unpaid volunteers on a shoestring budget from what's little more than a council flat in a residential block. From here, not only is the war directed, but plans are being made for a future Mugabe government. The dominant ideological influence is clearly Chinese, but ZANU insists it's completely non-aligned. In fact, much of its literature is Western, some of it critical of orthodox socialist systems. A good deal of ZANU's financial backing comes from the West as well, and many of its personnel are undergoing civilian training in the West. ZANU depends on handouts, so there are frequent fundraising tours to America and Europe. We gather that Christian Aid in Britain is going to allow us uh, £20,000. We got uh, promises from Oxfam. Uh, war on one promise uh -huh. to one one. give uh, you know, educational and medical help as in the past. The government, how is that? The network of Yes, we did. We had um, a meeting at the foreign office with the foreign office officials. Did we get anything? Sadly, <coughs> no. Yeah. Well, I think it's an interesting question just now, whether the British government does anything for ZANU or not. Look, we have clothes, food, everything. It's coming from those progressive organizations in Britain and in America and in Sweden. 
and all over the world. This shoe, I never bought it. Zanon never bought it. He never paid a penny out of it. This is, I think, from Sweden. If I didn't have it, how would I walk? Would I fight? I wouldn't fight. So the man who is, who is fighting in Zimbabwe more than a Zimbabwean is the one who contributed to this shoe. I'm able to plan because I'm putting on a jacket and on a trousers. And who is, who is giving me this? The people in Britain, the people in America. But what about the whites inside Rhodesia? Have you done anything to give them any confidence in ZANU or in their own futures come to that? You know, this is the problem which is really facing us at the moment. And we have always appealed to all our, our friends, all our allies who would like to see this armed struggle succeed, to really uh, tr transmit the message to those uh, people inside the country, whites. They must understand what we are fighting for and what we stand for. But it's what the guerrillas stand for that frightens the whites quite as much as the fear of being killed. They feel their prosperity is threatened by a doctrinaire Marxist dictatorship. What would things be like in terms of ownership of cars, of all the other sophisticated bits of equipment that many Rhodesians, black and white, already do have? Or are they going to all be part of this collective enterprise? Uh, can you ask your next question, and perhaps the next, around the area of socialism? Okay, how do you envisage that socialism would change the lives of the majority of people in Zimbabwe? Your next question, after that? Well, I'm, that would depend partly on the answer to these. Right, okay. Now, <clears throat> you seem to dwell a lot on this question of socialism. Now, what you are trying to say to me, or what you're trying to suggest to me, what has been suggested to us uh, over and over again, is that this idea of socialism will not work. In other words, we are being persuaded to get stuck with capitalism. During the 1920s, the 1930s, our fathers, our forefathers, worked like slaves, getting paid almost nothing to build the, uh, the economic infrastructure. Now, is it not common sense that when we fight to liberate the country and want to introduce a new system, we should, we should look for a system which is different from capitalism? There is an expression in England, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. And I wonder if you look around Europe or Africa whether you really believe that it's the socialist countries that are more efficient and happier. I'm absolutely convinced that um, I would be happier in a socialist country. I've recently been to the United States, the show of capitalism there, uh, the way it plays on your mind, even on television, when you ought to get more acquainted about the things that matter around the world. No, I shouldn't like to live under such a system. How can you be certain that whatever government you set up won't eventually become oppressive, won't be the sort of society where people are frightened of speaking out, or frightened of doing anything without looking over their shoulder? We do not want to create a socio-legal order in the country in which people are petrified, in which people go to bed having barricaded their doors and their windows because someone belonging to the special branch uh, of the police will break into their houses. This is what we've been fighting against. Every one of us has been in jail 10 years, 14 years. I, I myself, nine without trial. Every one of us has lived, has had to live scared of the police. How on earth could we create a society which is exactly like that? We don't want it. We are fed up of it. And this is why we are in this revolution for as long as is necessary to abolish this system. How do you see the future Zimbabwe should ZANU come to power? What would it mean for the ordinary small trader, the farmer, businessman? We will obviously collectivize the national pillars of the economy. Uh, I mean mining, for example, railways, Air Rhodesia, um, you know, the finance houses, those top uh, uh, occupations which have national repercussions. But the government, the, 
From our point of view, the government has no business selling matches or Coca-Cola, for example, uh, to people. The government has no, has no business in, uh, in running a dry cleaning shop, uh, for example. Uh, it, those um, small distributive um, and other social services are better left to the individual, to individuals who want to promote the quality of life. So that the, the fear of some state running down, uh, running human affairs right down to, uh, to the family. Uh, is, is foreign to, to, to our people, is foreign to our thinking, uh, and we have no intention of creating a system like that. Socialism, yes, but it does not mean totalitarian dispossession. It is absolutely wrong to allow a set of individuals to acquire the ownership and possession of resources which are God-given. They are not man-made. The land, the water, the forests, the animals, the fish in the river, the minerals, these are given us by nature. And it is in principle wrong for any one man to claim ownership of such resources. We should belong to the people as a whole. But Mugabe's socialist vision is seen by most whites as communism. If he comes, they say, we go. The whites who are in the country needn't fear us. If they are prepared to adjust, they will be regarded on the same basis as everybody else. But would the whites be left with any sort of vestige of the standards of living to which they've been accustomed in the past? If those standards of living have been based on color, then they, they must forget about them. But if they are based on the fact that they have the necessary skills to contribute, then they will continue to maintain them. And uh, no one is going to deprive them of what they are entitled by way of benefits from the economy if they have the necessary skills and uh, um, make the necessary inputs into the development of society. So they could still live in big houses sure. with swimming pools? Why not? Why not? They, 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 they are there, but not to the exclusion of uh, uh, people of other races. The British ambassador's residence, Maputo. Zimbabweans have a love-hate relationship with Britain. They were born British, educated in British ways, and feel betrayed by Britain. The communist world has provided more consistent friends. That's an irony that isn't lost on ZANU. For by fighting the Salisbury regime, they're in one sense fighting for Britain, fighting to put down a rebellion against the British crown. But still the British grope towards a compromise. This was the last attempt to set up a peace conference by Mr Callaghan's advisor, Cledwin Hughes. Uh, I've seen uh, President Nyerere, uh, President Kounda, uh, Mr Nkomo, and I've been to Salisbury and also to Pretoria. If I can say very briefly, if the parties agree to attend, there is a reasonable prospect that the talks could end s successfully. Every British government has felt it's done its best, but have they? Garfield Todd. There are only 90,000 adult whites in Rhodesia. That's all, 90,000 adult whites. I think the Western world <laughs> might have even bought them out 20 years ago if it had been necessary. But to think that 90,000 adult whites have been able to hold the world to ransom is not brave, it's just outrageous. And it's deeply, deeply racial, and it's deeply racial in Britain. Uh, you can't get away from it. If a black man had been in charge of the government in 1965 and had 270,000 black followers, and these people were keeping six million whites in subjection, and he broke away from Britain so as to be able to keep them for a thousand years under black rule. The freedom-loving countries of Britain and Europe and America would have fixed it up in a week. As it is, it's taken 15 years, and it's been the war, not Britain, that's forced the pace. Ian Smith has had to compromise. Those he once imprisoned are gathered to talk of peace, and behind the scenes, the frontline states have clearly exerted a moderating influence. There have already been concessions on a new constitution. The agreement needed now is on arrangements for transition from war to peace. 
Now, in the process of transference of power, it has to be recognized that the vicious force that minority has depended upon has to be demobilized and a completely new force based on uh, the fact that the people's interests have got to be safeguarded has got to emerge. We are not saying that only our troops must constitute the army. We are saying that alongside our troops there must come acceptable elements from the other side. And this will constitute the national army of the country. Uh, the Salu scouts have to go. The grey uh, the scouts. Ca these the are the mercenaries. These are the uh, ugly features, the unacceptable elements which have to go of necessity. All those commissioned officers who have been ideologically commit uh, committed to UDI and have supported treason have no right to be in command of a new army whatsoever. You wouldn't be prepared to accept some sort of formula whereby Joshua Nkomo's forces perhaps looked after the western part of Zimbabwe, where your own Zanla forces largely looked after the eastern sector, and where there was some joint army in the central sector and around the, the towns like we, Salisbury. We are thinking in terms of one army, and the patriotic front is going to emerge with our, one army. There will therefore not be any sector for Zapo, a sector for Zanu, we are one, and uh, that we shall remain. Are you proposing to merge your two armies in the near future? The principle is there, and uh, it is our hope that uh, very soon our uh, two armies will, be cons will constitute one force, as indeed our uh, two commands have constituted one J joint operations command. So what would happen if you get the free and fair elections that you ask for? Would you and Mr. Nkomo fight each other as rival parties or would you stand on the same platform? We have the patriotic front and our, our uh, hope is that we shall fight as one. We would like to constitute one front and uh, with just one leader um, campaigning as president of the front. That will mean that someone will have to be self-effacing. Someone well, will have to take a back seat. <laughs> well, this is what it means. It means that uh, the people will have to make their choice in due course. Would you be prepared to be a number two to Mr. Nkoma? <laughs> I'm prepared to be whatever the people want me to be. A lot of viewers might find that hard to believe, might find it very hard to believe that a man who's fought for so long would be prepared to give up the fruits of power just at the point well, of achieving We haven't them. been fighting for individual benefit. We have been fighting to get power into the hands of the people. In other words, we have been fighting a people's struggle. And uh, in the course of fighting for this struggle, some of our leaders, colleagues, have died. Others survive, but the people continue all the time. And so it's the interest of the people, really, that is the decisive factor, that's the paramount issue. What transference of power there's already been to the people was scorned by the Patriotic Front and the existing constitution has been rejected by the London Conference. Bishop Muzarewa is now Prime Minister, though effective power resides where it always did. But what if, even under a new constitution, the bishop was elected once again? If the bishop won the elections, which are free and fair, you might as well consider the devil would win the elections in heaven. Uh, we do not ever envisage a situation where the bishop could win elections which are free and fair. That can never, never happen. But it's perhaps the principle rather than a prediction that I'm looking for. The principle is there. Whoever wins the election naturally uh, becomes a leader. Whichever party wins the election naturally forms the government. And you would be prepared just given that hypothesis that the devil, as you put it, Mr. Mozareba were to win, you would allow the bishop to become or to remain prime minister, as he would say it, and you would form a legitimate constitutional opposition in parliament? We are prepared that the bishop will not win. But if miracles happen and the bishop uh, won, well, fine. He should lead the country. Why not? Yes, we are for a democratic system. And uh, in a democratic system, you have to accept, you see, the uh, uh, verdict 
of the people. When I spoke to you in Maputo, you said that if the people were in favor, then you would certainly favor a one-party state. Now, how would you feel if Bishop Muzarewa were to declare a one-party state, having won an election? Once again, if that is the verdict of the people, this, uh, uh, the decision uh, by which we must abide. And where would that leave you and ZANU supporters? Imagine a situation where uh, ZANU and ZAPU can lose. I, I think together we constitute uh, the most formidable uh, front of all the groups inside the country. Any uh, possibility of our being defeated in any elections. What, I'm, well, what some, some of us are fighting for is to see that this oppressive system is crushed. We don't care whether, I don't even care whether I would be part of the, of the, of, 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 of the top echelon in the room. I'm not, I'm not worried, but I, I die to see, I, I, I'm dying to see a, a, a change that, you know, in the system. That's all. That's all. I would like to see the young people enjoying together. Black, white, enjoying together. In a new Zimbabwe, that's all. Much will depend not just on what constitution is agreed in London. The British government is biased in favor of uh, uh, the internal regime. Are you then distrustful of Lord Carrington as Foreign Secretary and Mrs. Thatcher, the Prime no, Minister? No, I'm not, but um, they have a political stand which favors the internal regime. And uh, they, as individuals, are probably um, free of bias. Conservatives are obviously in favor of the regime, the present re internal regime, uh, continuing and hence uh, the attempt to lift sanctions. How are you that this conference will succeed, that there is an end to the war in sight? I think if we continue as we have started, um, the possibility of reaching a settlement is there, but we hope the sincerity with which Lord Carrington has uh, so far um, handled I issues and listened uh, to our own criticisms and observations uh, will help the conference to conclude uh, a peace agreement.